On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Ryan Weeks. He is the CISO at Datto. And we're going to be tackling an important topic that can be accessible to any size organization, and that is growing security awareness and maturity within your organization. Ryan, thank you for being on the podcast today. Yeah, it's good to be here. Awesome. So um, for anyone who's not familiar with maybe what Datto does as some context, could you maybe give us a little high level of what you guys do and maybe uh, as a starting point? Yeah, so for those that aren't familiar with Datto, Datto provides uh, small and medium-sized businesses technology solutions, really enterprise-grade technology solutions delivered to them through the managed services IT channel. And so to translate that, there are a bunch of people out there that run their own IT shops, and they primarily service small, medium-sized businesses. And Datto builds technology for those IT shops to be able to use to protect those end customers of the small, medium-sized businesses. And so our customers are MSPs and MSPs have small, medium-sized businesses. So we build technology that meets both of their needs. Awesome. I know you've been doing this for a while and we were chatting uh, beforehand about you know, security, you know, very similar problems, building security programs at, at any size and scale of a company. Maybe when you're looking at security programs and kind of where to start and you know, let's say you are a small company or a mid-sized company and you're, you're looking to evaluate where you should be the scope. Where do you start with something like that? Where to start is usually the hardest question, right? I think the best advice I can give is don't start with your own ideations. Find a framework. Find some mental model to use to benchmark yourself against. I personally love the NIST cybersecurity framework. For some people, that's still a little bit too meaty because it, you know, while it has five focus areas, it's 140 plus questions around your capabilities and um, that kind of help you get a sense of where your kind of maturity is relative to those capabilities. And um, you know, if you're starting out, even that can be a little bit daunting. But I do like NIST because it does break things very cleanly down into five kind of competency areas. Some people love the CIS framework, you know, and that's even broken down into kind of like basic controls or foundational controls and then, you know, advanced controls. And so I would say if, if you don't know where to start, pick a framework and then figure out how to start benchmarking yourself against that framework. Really what that's going to do is drive a sense of how capable you are relative to what those standards define good as looking like. And, you know, just to kind of put a pin a little bit in this idea and pop the bubble, no framework is going to be 100% perfect, but it's a place to start, right? And that's exactly what we're just talking about is where to start. So I would definitely start with a framework, you know, get that idea of capability. And then that's going to drive this concept of maturity no matter what kind of level security program you're looking to build, you want to have this idea of, um, you know, kind of a capability and maturity model for the different areas of the program that you're trying to build. And really what that is, is you hear a lot about companies talking about, oh, you need to build a risk-based security program. You need to be investing in addressing your largest security risks. Well, when you're just starting out, you might not even have a sense of what your largest risks are. So again, how do you start? Well, you could think about your maturity model relative to the framework as, you know, the areas where I have the lowest maturity have a potentially high amount of risk. And so, you know, if I'm, you know, uh, one across the board on a capability maturity model, I'm operating with a lot of risk. And so it's probably more important for me just to focus on getting my program up to a two across the board than it is to worry about any individual risks. So again, when you're just beginning, really focus on maturing the program as a whole and using a framework to help you do that. So I guess even that may be a question that comes before, you know, where to start is why to start, right? So I guess, let's say you're at different stages of maturity. You know, if you don't have an existing program or let's say it's a less mature Is being reactive to an issue that's pending or, you know, there might be a a security issue or maybe as a part of your sales process, if you're a B2B SaaS company, you always have a need. Is some of the need to move up the maturity model reactive in in a few cases? I think, unfortunately, across the board, it still is a little reactive. 
you know, you see most companies get really serious about building security programs for a couple, you know, kind of three distinct reasons. The first is customer demands. And really the customer demands are driven by their own regulatory compliance. Hey, I can only use you as a vendor or I can only consume your services or you're only allowed to sell me that good if you're compliant with, you know, XYZ standard. And then you dig into that standard and you realize, oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here about security. We should go figure out how to do that and meet this compliance standard, right? And so then you wind up getting compliance-based security programs. And really, when you're starting out, a compliance-based security program is really like your lowest possible bar, in my opinion, right? So the people that would argue with me are the people that have to be like CMMC or, you know, DFARS or, you know, like just really ridiculously complicated security and compliance frameworks that are incredibly mature. They would be like, well, that's not true. But, you know, for the most part, most security compliance objectives within those regulatory statutes are not super complicated. It does require, you know, people, process, and technology to achieve them, but not super high maturity, right? So that's number one is kind of customer demand based off of regulatory compliance. The second is an adverse event, right? Something bad has already happened and it woke us up to the fact that we need to manage our risk better or we need someone smart in this area to help us manage or, you know, kind of traverse this landscape more safely. And that's also being driven kind of, you know, also from, you know, boards of directors and executives looking to kind of, you know, whether it's your own business or your Fortune 100 company, you're kind of thinking about how do I manage the operating risk of my company to its lowest possible denominator? Security is, you know, one of the kind of core tenants of kind of business operating risk now that needs to be managed. And so adverse events will definitely raise that up in terms of your sense of needing to manage it. So that's number two. And then number three is if you're lucky enough to have someone come on board into your company that has kind of been through it before and just understands the need for this functional area to exist. And they kind of advocate and get others on board with this idea that the security program needs to be built out. And that doesn't necessarily need to mean it needs to be a new key leader or a new executive in a company. It could be a tech in an IT security team, right? I mean, my career, I got started, I was a firewall administrator, right? And the way I got to where I was is constantly saying, we should be doing X better and this is why. Right. And eventually people listened and they're like, okay, well, here, we'll just manage this whole team, manage that whole problem. Oh, there's a whole nother problem here. Here, here's another team. And like, you know, just keep growing your purview that way and driving it from the inside out. Right. There's nothing saying that it needs to be a top down mandate. It can be bottom up as well. So, unfortunately, yeah, still reactive. But I think those are the three main things that are kind of driving companies to try and invest in building security programs. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I guess staying with the thought of, you know, maybe early stage in the maturity or maybe not even with any security capabilities, let's say your company that is pre-security professional, right? We don't have somebody designated with that. There's a VP of engineering, CTO, you know, software engineering teams. At what point do they start looking and going, you know what, we might need to bring the security professional in at this point? And obviously you mentioned customer demands and compliance as being a big driver. That could be, but what do you see as some of the, like if we don't have that security professional in-house and we need to potentially move forward, when do you do that? But this is kind of core in the wheelhouse of data, right? Most SMBs do not even have IT teams. And so when they think technology, they think of a managed service providers. And managed service providers are also providing security. And, and really what it comes down to is building a trusted partner, Right. Even if you have an in-house IT team that doesn't have the skills or the kind of staff to really focus on that problem, you can, in very low-cost ways, get the advice of security professionals, right? You can engage with a managed service provider to do an assessment of your organization and, and give you an opinion about you know, where they see your deficiencies and where they might even be able to help you, right? If you want to kind of do staff augmentation by bringing in an MSP, which is what, you know, most companies do. Um, Even with MSPs, 
We're seeing them kind of pair up with MSSPs, right? A managed service provider pairing up with managed security services providers in order to bring a higher level of service to those companies. And so there's, there's definitely a lot of like resource out there. Maybe you don't want to go to a technology provider. You just want to go and get like an audit. You can go find companies that'll do, um, you know, security program maturity assessments and have them come in and do a day, two day assessment of where you are, right? Like I said, NIST cybersecurity framework, go find someone that will come in and walk you through a NIST CSF assessment for a day. And before you go hire the security person or figure out if you want to outsource it to an MSSP, try and understand where you are and what you need so that you at least know when you go look for that resource, what you're looking for and why, right? And maybe they need to have you know, experience in three very specific areas for your company. And each company is going to be different, right? So I think that's why that benchmarking against that framework can help with that conversation. Yeah, it's interesting because I think, um, you know, the MSSP is kind of addressing this gap that you mentioned where we're pre-needing to bring in, you know, the CISO to build out the security team, but we also know we need something. But we really don't know what <laughs> we need. So let's get that assessment. Let's get the audit. And then it's, uh, hey, we potentially need a compliance solution. And then now it's like, I need somebody who knows, you know, SOC 2, Type 2 to at least get us working with, you know, enterprise customers potentially. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think of MSSPs as buying maturity, right? So we talked about that capability and maturity. Maybe you're low on both. You know, you're going to buy it one way or another. You're going to buy technology, you're going to buy a person on your staff, or you're going to buy a third party. I think it's a question of what's your individual business need and how do you best address that need? And so there's a bunch of different ways, but I think it, it really starts with an understanding of yourself. And so a mental model I have when I think about building security programs and specifically what I'm going to build starts with three questions. Do I know myself? Do I know my enemy, my threat actors? And do I know the battlefield? Do I know the environment in which them and I are going to collide and how we might collide? And to me, that framework exercise helps you get some of that clarity on knowing yourself and maybe even knowing your environment a little bit more, knowing your threat actor is kind of a higher level capability and maturity thing that I think is still not accessible to a lot of smaller IT organizations. But there is a lot of information out there. You just got to know how to look for it. And that might be an area where it makes sense to either buy a piece of technology or, or partner with the service provider to help you get that insight. But yeah, just another pro tip there and how to think about that problem. That's excellent. And yeah, you know, I was just thinking, like, we talked to a lot of people that, uh, you know, would like to get into security, right? You know, a software engineer, you know, somebody who's in a company that clearly doesn't have a security professional designated yet. And it's kind of just loosely moving forward and, and someone potentially wants to move into security. You mentioned you started firewalls and, you know, you kind of uh, asked questions and you saw how you could improve yourself and the organization you're working for. Any ideas or maybe tips for someone who is you know, let's say a software engineer or an engineer of any kind, and it's like, hey, I'd like to get into security. My org doesn't really have it. Is it really just, you know, grabbing one of the frameworks and starting to understand how they can apply it? Is that as as easy as that? It's a really good question. And I think the reason that we have such a hard time answering it is the fact that we don't really understand that people learn differently. I'm very much a learn by doing, learn by being exposed type of person. And so yeah, I went and got my master's degree in information assurance. And I did that specifically with the intent of getting exposed to all of the problem areas that a security program manager is going to have to face. Right. And then as I continued to develop, I kind of refined that education with certification, right? Certified information security manager, certified information system security professional CISSP. I forget what the actual acronym is now. But, you know, some people learn through certification. Some people learn through academics taking a course. Some people learn through reading books. I do this uh, cyber call every week for managed service providers. And we just had a guest on who runs uh, a YouTube channel called Cyberspatial. And really what it is, it's a, a YouTube channel that is driven specifically to help career technologists expose themselves to more areas of information security and actually make it a little more accessible for them. Another thing I'm excited about is this idea that a lot of universities are understanding that you know, we're not going to fill the cybersecurity talent gap by cranking out 
high potential entry level kids just out of undergraduate and master's degree programs. And there needs to be kind of this in-flight career retraining, career retooling, right? And so I've hired people that literally stopped their job, moved someplace for nine months and did a deep dive course and like how to become an intrusion monitoring engineer and um, wound up getting jobs. And, you know, so people are looking for these kind of, how can I take a sabbatical from my life for a small period of time? Or how can I overlay this on a day-to-day basis with my life and figure out how to kind of expose myself to this? And so I know that's not really an answer to your question. It's probably like a hundred different ideas on how to go about it. But you know, it is important, I think, that people understand that it is an accessible field. I think there's this myth that like cybersecurity professionals are like the most elite and most capable and smartest. And we're just engineers at heart trying to fix hard problems. And we just happen to fix one of the hardest problems of all. And so if, you know, if you're interested in solving hard problems, information security is probably the right place for you to be. It's interesting that uh, you called it a myth and I, uh, I recorded a podcast with a mass security professional and I brought up, I guess, the Hollywood you know, media view of hacking and security. It kind of reminds me of like when people talk about AI, people only think about what Hollywood, you know, walking, talking robots. And it's like, well, that's not necessarily what AI is going to be. But security has this myth, this kind of created persona of uh, the hackers and everyone's under pressure and somebody's always at a command line always a command line in a movie, right? And they're just hacking away at keyboards to figure out a defense to something or crack something. And it seems that that has perpetuated this myth in people realize, you know, perception of reality. People think it's super complicated. It is super complicated, but it's a barrier. It's a mountain they can't overcome to actually get into. And that's... Yeah, and I think the other thing to realize is information security is not, unless you're at, you know, like the level that I'm at where you're running an entire security for a whole company, you don't need to understand everything about information security. There are 40 different sub-disciplines within information security for you to specialize in. And so part of it is just exposing yourself to all those different problem domains and figuring out what you would be most interested in learning, right? To me, the most capable security people that I've ever hired are just the ones that wind up are being incredibly passionate and motivated in one very specific area of information security and are willing to do anything to learn and advance in that area. There's one thing I forgot too, which is kind of self-education. There's a lot of really good stuff out there, you know, like tools, you know, and resources for you to test and develop skills against, you know, things like, you know, damn vulnerable web app and, you know, just books that you can use and, you know, just all sorts of just tools like building a lab and or, you know, going, participating in a capture the flag event, like finding a team. Like there's so many ways to expose yourself to this and realize that there's opportunity here. Really, we need more people that are just technically inclined to get over this idea that they're not good enough because anybody that's technically inclined is good enough as long as you're willing to do the work to specialize you know, you'll find a lot of people are increasingly willing to invest time in you to help you develop in that area. I guess just to tie this off, I had a question in terms of, you know, you and hiring for your team. So, you know, knowing the gap, I think you mentioned someone, you know, who'd gone through retooling and they came out. Is it looking for some of those diamonds in the rough? Because obviously we all see the glorified headlines of, you know, 2 million shortage of, you know, professionals in, in security. To grow your team to add headcount, is it literally looking at the areas for more aptitude and maybe just desire? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to give away all my secrets. <laughs> but I think uh, there are several things that I think you have to think about. Hiring is about more than just finding the right person. It's studying the problem, just like everything else, right? Hiring for information security is a hard problem. And so break that down. Well, where do you find talent? How early in the pipeline are you willing to go and find that talent? Are you willing to find a technical high school that has security professionals and go and talk to them and encourage them to go to college and then ultimately sponsor an internship and have them join you? Are you willing to go to college career fairs and develop relationships with professors and go in and talk to classes and mentor students, even though they may never work for you, right? Like that's another huge pipeline. There's also like, you know, just got networking. Most of us in security 
are just trying to do our day jobs and like find other smart people to help us. And like networking is something we do for a few hours a month. There are people that have incredible networks that you can tap and they're called cybersecurity recruiters, right? And you develop good relationships with them and they'll help you find good people. The other thing too is you have to realize that like recruiting is sales. What are these people buying, right? It has to be mutually beneficial for you and for them. And so, you know, the thing that works for me is just being incredibly transparent about what this person is walking into and why you need them and letting them decide whether or not that's a problem that they want to attack or not, right? And I find, you know, two out of 10 candidates might walk away from something when you kind of describe the actual problem that you need them to solve, but the right people get really excited about it. And so the right people leads me into my second point, which is building your ideal persona, right? Having a values-driven approach to your interview process and understanding how those people map to those values and those criteria. And for me, there's really two personas that I look for. One is kind of experienced, humble, with very strong executive functions, like critical thinking and reasoning. And, you know, I love to put those people through very difficult scenario-based interviews to make sure that they're really capable of kind of traversing a difficult to think about problem and how they would approach it. And then the other profile is this kind of self-taught, high aptitude, high motivation, relatively little experience, the self-made kind of persona. And to me, that's actually a huge untapped area of potential is because a lot of people are looking for people with five years of experience. I've met students who have worked for me for almost my entire career now out of college in their kind of post-college careers. I've met them having more skills and capability in an undergrad program than people I'd interviewed with 10 years of experience. And so I think we need to throw out this idea that years of experience or a certain level of education equals an ideal candidate. We have to be willing to assess for aptitude, motivation, and capability and determine what the right mix is based off of the role that we're trying to hire for. And likewise, if you're a technically inclined person looking to get into cybersecurity, pick the persona that you want to build and figure out how you want to invest in building that persona as a recruit because different companies are looking for different personas. Awesome, man. That's some fantastic advice. Hopefully we didn't uh, dislodge all your secrets and uh, we're not going to impact your hiring workflow, but I can't thank you enough for being on and uh, sharing all this detail. And uh, is it okay if we link your uh, LinkedIn URL in case somebody wants to reach out with a follow-up question? Yeah, sure. No problem. Awesome. Awesome. The topic of the day was talking about growing uh, security awareness and maturity. I I think Ryan did a great job walking us through what you can do in in some of those areas. Hopefully that's a a value to you guys. And uh, that's it for this episode. We'll be back again, a different set of topics, different guests. And you know, as always, I'm just asking uh, two things. One, keep hitting me up with ideas of, of episodes because that's really helping me find the guests to kind of address those questions. And and then also subscribe to the podcast. It's been really growing at a great rate. I can't thank everyone who's listening enough, but uh, yeah, that'd be the next best thing you could do for us. And until uh, next episode, we'll talk to you then. Thanks.